Manila together with my colleague Choi Bailey from CDIA. And uh, yeah, for us it's already afternoon. It's 4:30 in the afternoon, and um, yeah, I I want to um, yeah welcome all of you colleagues and partners uh, to the fifth webinar of the TurboClick webinar series, the first of this year's. And um, these webinar series aim to exchange experiences and good practices among our members as well as other interested colleagues who ever wants to join. Today we'll speak um, about the international climate policy and the role of the urban sector, in particular the outcomes of the conference um, of the parties and um, yeah, since most of you um, might have not used um, Saba web meetings before, I would just like to give some technical advices. So on the left side of your interface, you are um, yeah, you can see the meeting tools to participate in the webinar. For example, here the hand, uh, raise your hand. You can agree or disagree. Um, yeah, happy about it or just give an applaud. And please mute your microphone when you're not speaking to ensure a good understanding of all the presenters. To avoid the time constraints at the end, we let the three presenters finish their presentations and raise the questions at the end. So either, either by raising the hand symbol or send them directly in the chat. If the chat question is relevant for all, you can also shift it to send to all, otherwise please select the person and address it directly. Our knowledge consultant Luciana Meyer is supporting us, so if you have any technical concerns uh, feel free to approach her via the chat. And uh, I'm Eva Ringhoff, I'm the joint speaker of the TurboClick group and will chair this webinar today. Yet yeah, today we'll speak about the urban context in the international climate policy, um, local government advocacy in the international climate processes have been very successful and is reflected in the new Paris Agreement, the so-called COP21 conference of the parties. Uh, local and subnational actors are acknowledged within um, an international climate agreement for the first time and even cities and regions have been recognized, engaged and empowered and are now faced with a great challenge ahead in taking serious climate actions. We are excited to present and discuss now what are the main outcomes of Paris in general and also especially for the urban sector and how have cities been engaged in the COP21 process, what have been reached and what are the next steps. So to come to our program today, um, the role of cities um, at the COP21 and their consideration in the Paris Agreement will be uh, presented by Ms. Lisa Lebershausen and Ms. Katrin Eisenberg. Lisa Lebershausen is Jet, uh, GIZ advisor, cities and climate change to the BMUB, to the um, minist uh, Ministry of Environment and she holds a master's degree in international development studies. Uh, she has taken part in BMZ and GIZ Young Professional Program for Development Cooperation working as junior advisor on sustainable urban infrastructure and cities and climate change with GIZ India, including secondments to water and sanitation program at World Bank Daily Office and also ECLEI uh, Secretariat. Uh, Katrin Eisenbeis, she's advisor of the sector program Metropolitan Regions. She holds a master degree in urban and regional development and a bachelor degree in geography. She has taken part in BMZ uh, and GIZ trainee program for development cooperation working on sustainable urban transport with uh, the regional program in ASEAN based in Bangkok, including some secondments to the World Resource Institute in Washington DC and the Environmental Division in BMZ. Prior to the Young Professional Program, she worked uh, with Fraunhofer Institute in Stuttgart for the Morgan 
that uh, City Insights project on governance and mobility. Um, the last part will be uh, presented by Martin Deer. This is about C40, the city's finance facility, and about supporting cities to deliver low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure projects. Martin Deer is product manager, urban resilience, uh, with the global initiative on disaster risk management, and coordinate the new commission project C40. He's an international urban development expert working since nine years for GISAT in different functions, amongst others as program coordinator for the Urban Governance and Decentralization Program in Ethiopia and as advisor for the sector project Urban Development in GISAT headquarters in Germany. Um, and at the end, we will have some time for uh, an interactive discussion uh, where you uh, will be able to raise all the questions you had, so feel free uh, to put it uh, prior to that uh, into the chat or rise, raise it directly at the end. We're now looking forward to an interesting discussion, and I will hand over to Ms. Lisa Lebershausen. Hello everybody, I hope you can hear me now. Um, as Eva just pointed out, uh, together with my colleague Katrin, I will be talking about the role of cities at COP and their considerations in the Paris Agreement. Um, to give you an idea what we will show you, I will be giving you a brief summary of uh, what are the key outcomes of COP, especially in the Paris Agreement. Later on, Katrin will talk about the role of cities in climate change and then specifically the role of cities but also regions took at COP by giving examples of the engagement of cities and uh, other subnational governments and as well commitments they raised during the COP in Paris. And um, I will then talk again about the consideration of cities and uh, subnational actors in the Paris outcomes. And after a short summary, we'll, we'll later on have uh, time to, to answer your questions. So to start with, um, you might not all be very familiar with uh, how is really the setup at the conferences of the party. So I would like to just uh, make sure that you understand that when we talk about the Paris Agreement, there's the Paris Agreement as the legal binding new agreement. But there's also always uh, COP decisions that uh, accompany the agreement. So what I would first like to point out is mainly the Article 2 of the Real Paris Agreement, which gives the main big lines that have been decided on in Paris. The first one is the long-term mitigation goal. So that has been decided that uh, the international community will work on climate issues to make sure that the temperature rise will stay below two degrees and there will be even efforts to maintain it even at 1.5 as a maximum. This shall be reached by making sure that greenhouse gases are peaking as soon as possible, taking into consideration that in developing countries this peak may take a little bit longer than in already developed countries. And there's a common understanding that uh, there should be a greenhouse gas neutrality reached by the second half of the century. Greenhouse gas neutrality, that means that there should be net zero emissions. So there will be still certain emissions, but they have to be neutralized by carbon sinks, for example, as it can be wetlands, forests, etc. Another main point is that adaptation has been uh, considered as an, of equal importance then mitigation, so it has been decided that uh, the adaptive capacity shall be enhanced at all countries, resilience needs to be strengthened and vulner vulnerability reduced. And as a third point, all international finance flows need to be consistent with low emission and resilient development, so they should be shifted from high to low emission activities and from risky to more resilient investments. I will go to finance a little bit later. So these are the three main lines pointed out in the Paris Agreement. Um, further on, 
within the agreement and within the Camp 9 COP decisions, which are a little bit more detailed, um, we find further agreements like, for example, the ambition mechanism. The ambition mechanism is very important for making sure that there is a dynamic agreement that is not decided just on what can be done now, but there is still scope for making further efforts in the future. One very important part for the ambition, ambition mechanism is the five-year cycle of a global stock take of the collective process to reach the long-term goals. So where is the world? Um, is it on track to reach the goal of 2 degrees or even 1.5 degrees? This is a process which will start in uh, 2023, but already in 2018 there will be a first facilitative dialogue to talk about how this is going to be reached. And the ambition mechanism is combined with something which goes hand in hand with the transparency framework. So before COP, all the countries were asked to submit their INDCs, their intended nationally determined contributions, so to show what they are going to do to um, reduce greenhouse gases and to increase resilience. And uh, these now called NDCs, so nationally determined contributions, will also have to be reported in a, on a five-year track. And uh, then they should also be given the opportunity for each country to show progression, so to do what they have already stated to do, but also to make further commitments uh, and to make sure that the overall goal can be raised. So the first uh, of these five-year processes is going to be in 2020, and those countries who have submitted INDCs for this period, they can already come up with new uh, further commitments for the coming years. Another part uh, of the COP outcome is that uh, loss and damage has been equally addressed. So not only adaptation, but additionally, um, it has been decided that it should uh, it has to be looked at loss and damage apart from adaptation. So there was the decision to enhance cooperation and support for loss and damage, building on the Warsaw interna International Mechanism. The Warsaw International Mechanism uh, came up at COP19 in uh, uh, Warsaw and um, it is a mechanism to establish ways to address issues of loss and damage by enhancing knowledge and understanding, by stressing the dialogue on these issues and by enhancing also action on, on loss and damage or to avoid them uh, financially with technical uh, uh, technology transfer of capacity building. And what is really important also to note that there has been no agreement on any type of compensation or liability. So no country is going to be made liable for loss and damage that happened at another country. Um, Coming back to the issue of finance and generally support, I've already been saying that uh, finance flows should be also supporting the uh, Paris Agreement. And it has been decided that uh, until 2020 and until 20, from 2020 to 2025, developed countries shall raise annually 100 billion um, US dollar for supporting developing countries in um, achieving mitigation and resilience building. In generally, the mobilization of additional private finance is uh, understood as a collective effort. So every country should make efforts to do so. Generally yet financing and other support is to be taken prim um, primarily by developed countries. Nevertheless, all the other countries are invited to also voluntary support. For example, there has been a pledge of financial um, assistance uh, from a country like, like Vietnam as well. Um, then another issue we'd like to just uh, quickly raise is the part of capacity building as it's uh, from special importance looking at GIZ work as uh, on international cooperation. So at uh, Paris it was decided to build a Paris committee on capacity building. Um, this committee is to establish and oversee a work plan on enhanced capacity building from the period 2016 to 2020. Overall, the idea is to identify capacity needs 
and to increase the synergies between different activities and also the cooperation of all levels. So the international cooperation, but also the cooperation between nations and within the nations between the uh, sub-national level, so including the local level. And finally, it's uh, of great importance that capacity building programs should be oriented at the specific needs of a country, so uh, to make sure that there is more ownership of the different countries. And finally, to sum up and to talk about a little bit the form of the Paris Agreement, um, it's important to say that it is ambition with the goal of uh, yeah, the peak of the emissions and uh, net zero emissions in the second half of the century. It's a dynamic agreement, so there is scope to further enhance the uh, commitments already made. And it is a fair agreement because it still gives more um, responsibility to developed countries, but it also takes in, um, into responsibility the developing countries. Um, it does not make any more the differentiation between the Annex 1 and Annex 2 countries, which we had in the Kyoto Protocol, um, but still talks about the common but differentiated responsibility. So everybody has to put a share in, but all, uh, of course, looking at the national circumstances and possibilities. It is a universal agreement, uh, agreement, so it is binding for all parties and it is legal under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, the signature of the agreement will start on a session, high-level session on 22nd April. So then there is a one-year period to sign it, but of course it is not limited to this one year, but uh, afterwards also uh, further countries can join. Um, when will it enter into force? So it is foreseen to start in the year 2020, yet um, for entering into force, it is necessary that at least 55 of the parties, so the countries, have ratified it by that point in time, and these 55 countries need to represent 55% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So only if that happens, it will really enter into force. So, so far from a little bit more complex and theoretic background, uh, what has happened in Paris, what is the outcome in the decisions and in the agreement. And then I would now like to hand over to my colleague Katrin, who will focus on the role of cities. Thank you. Yeah, hello and welcome from my side. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so after this introduction on the key elements of the Paris Agreement in general, we want to have a look at the role cities played at the COP21 and how they are considered in the Paris Agreement. So many of you probably know the role cities play when it comes to climate change. Um, cities account for about 70% of the global energy demand. They consume about 75% of natural resources worldwide and they are responsible for about 70 to 80% of energy related GHG emissions. So while you could say that cities and with cities of course I mean the people living in them and their activities including industries um, that they are main drivers of global warming. They are at the same time highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So one reason for this is that cities are often located in risk prone areas, for instance along coasts or river basins, but also another reason is that um, the high density of people, um, of infrastructure and capital, etc. Um, we can find in cities, which increases loss and damage in the case of extreme weather events. So while this makes cities vulnerable to climate change impacts. At the same time, this accumulation of people and assets offers efficiency gains, for example, when it comes to the provision of basic services. And cities are well known to be hubs for knowledge and innovation, um, since they are home for educational institutions, as well as research and development institutions, the private, the private sector, and so on. So to summarize it shortly, cities have a triple role when it comes to climate change. They are drivers of climate change as well as they are victims of climate change. And last but not least, they have the potential to initiate change for low carbon development. For example, um, when it comes to change in consumer behavior or um, the development of technical 
solutions. And many mayors um, have already been demonstrating that they are champions and the cities are forerunners for taking action on climate change, not at least um, yeah, at the COP21 in Paris. So at the COP21 um, and also before that, a lot of cities, their mayors and city networks um, such as ECLEI advocated for the role cities play in climate change and to be recognized as central actors in the fight against it. A lot of cities have become forerunners in the fight against global warming, um, both with concrete actions in their own cities as well as, as with um, joining forces for initiatives and commitments. And showing those activities and commitments as role models for national governments and in order to advocate not only for the recognition of subnational stakeholders, but also for an ambitious agreement was um, in the focus of the numerous side events that cities organized at the COP21. And with a view to the time, um, I don't want to name every single side event or commitment, but I want to highlight two of them. One is the Lima Paris Action Agenda, which was launched in 2014 by the presidencies of the COP20 in Peru and COP21 in Paris, together with the Office of the UN General Secretary and UNFCCC um, Secretariat. And the agenda's aim was and still is to mobilize climate action of subnational actors um, in order to create a positive momentum in Paris and help to achieve an ambitious agreement. And those no party actors, um, inclusive cities, regional governments, but also companies and the civil society um, can now showcase their commitments on the NATSCA platform, which is standing for non-state actor zone for climate action. And where you can already find commitments by over 2,000 cities and 150 regions. And we will also send you the link um, to this website and also to the other um, initiatives um, later together with the presentation so that you can have a closer look at it. Following um, the example of the Lima Paris Action Agenda, a lot of initiatives were launched at the COP21 and also beforehand and also already existing initiatives and commitments were renewed and signed by other actors at the COP21. So a quite famous one you probably know um, is the Compact of Mayors um, under the lead of Michael Bloomberg and the C40 initiative together with ECLEI and UCLG, um, which aims at mitigating local GHG emissions and that has reached a number of 436 signatures at the COP21. Another one um, that is new and that I want to highlight here is the Compact of States and Regions in which subnational governments from six continents committed themselves to mitigate their GHG emissions and in addition um, also launched the global initiative Regions ADAPT with the aim to develop adaptation plans at a regional level. So this new coalition shows that um, not only cities but also the cooperation of neighboring municipalities at a regional level is becoming more and more relevant and um, is also recognized to be um, important in the, in the fight against climate change and it was also recognized in the agreement um, but we will come to this point later on. So like those examples, there are also other um, initiatives launched by, launched by actors from different levels and sectors and with different goal setting regarding mitigation and adaptation or also different topics in the focus, for instance, um, on climate friendly mobility or the protection of tropical forests. So the other outcome um, that I want to highlight um, of the COP21 under the lead of cities um, was the Paris City Hall Declaration. And the declaration is the outcome of the Climate Summit for Local Leaders that was organized by the mayor of Paris together with Michael Bloomberg and held in the Paris City Hall, um, as the name of the declaration indicates, back to back to the climate negotiations in Paris. So the declaration includes both goals, um, the mitigation of GHG emissions and the transition, transition to 100% renewable energy as well as the participatory development of resilient strategies and adaptation plans. So the Paris City Hall Declaration includes um, key elements and commitments that were also included in the climate agreement for national governments. 
And with this, um, I would like to hand back to Lisa, who is going to have a closer look at how cities and also other subnational actors are considered in the Paris Agreement itself. Yeah, okay, so um, thank you, Katrin. And yes, as uh, Eva in her introduction already very correctly pointed out, um, a very big um, success for cities in, in COP has been that for the first time cities and other subnational levels including regions have been formally uh, recognized as important actors um, to address climate change so um, it is re really a, a good a really big achievement and further on in the directly in the agreement there is be um, there is a, a consideration also of the local levels uh, when talking about adaptation needs and about uh, capacity building. Of course, in the agreement to make sure that it is long lasting over time and that it is acceptable for all the countries, the um, provisions are more generally. This is why I want to uh, continue with the decisions. So the more precise decisions are basically made in COP21. Um, there again, we have um, the consideration, so the, the invitation for all countries to strengthen the cooperation and the work with cities and regions um, to, uh, to make sure that we can reach the goal of the COP agreement uh, that the greenhouse gases can be reduced and the resilience can be increased. In capacity building, again, um, the subnational level should be taken into consideration and further be stressed according to the local needs as well. And uh, another very special part is that there is an own paragraph only talking about non-party stakeholders, which also points out how much important was given to all those levels, all actors which are not the national level itself, though this including regional governments, local governments, but also other actors. And um, here it has been pointed out that it is highly welcome the efforts that all these uh, stakeholders are already uh, undergoing, that all the commitments they have made and also the work they have already made, because as we all know, cities are already working on mitigation and adaptation issues since uh, many years. Then these stakeholders are invited to scale up all their efforts and to support the actions on the national and international level. It is recognized that there is still um, knowledge, technology transfer, um, et cetera, to be done to strengthen lo the local communities. And it is further recognized that there is also a need from the national level to provide incentives for other actors to especially reduce uh, the emissions, but also to um, increase the resilience at all levels. So finally, to sum up COP as a success for cities, um, yes, because the recognition is an aspect that uh, international um, city networks such as ICLE have been fighting for practically since the first uh, COP in Berlin in 1995. So this is, as I already pointed out, a very big achievement. Then um, the one of the expectations of the local level was to get further engaged on the one hand side into the process, into the national agenda setting, but also in the considerations of national strategies and policies. Of course, the second part is more up to the national level, but the provisions, so the basis for this is, is practically made and the opportunities for engagement of showing their commitments um, has been uh, very nicely pointed out by Katrin to you. So what cities have done, what regions have done in COP, how they were engaged. The third point is the empowerment. Uh, empowerment looking, of course, at capacity building, at access to finance. So this is a point that has been a, a, a basic uh, yeah, let's say a basic provision within the Paris outcomes. So um, empower the local level to find and implement own solutions. There has been uh, this first considerations and of course it will still be up now to more detailed um, decisions at national levels, at the levels of international organizations. How is this further, further going to be detailed out? And this is also something we would like to discuss with you. So how do you see this strengthening of the local level from your 
um, point of view from the experience of work given by the um, outcomes of COP. And I think uh, now we'll hear a little bit uh, further on one of these issues, especially empowerment, looking at the financial side from Martin. So I would here like to thank you and hand over to Martin for his pre presentation. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning from Berlin. And thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm talking a little bit of a new cooperation project between the German government and the C40 uh, Cities Climate Leadership Group. Um, the C40 is a global network of mega cities. Yeah? So it's the big cities, the cities beyond 3 million and more inhabitants. Um, we're talking about um, about Johannesburg, about Nairobi, about uh, Dar es Salaam, about uh, Berlin, New York, Rio de Janeiro, these kind of cities. And um, so in the frame of the COP and the, the, the C40 forum, this was a, a site event, so to speak, of the, the, the local summit in the, in the Paris City Hall, the C40 Cities Finance Facility was jointly launched by C40 together with um, BMZ and the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, whereas the BMZ has pledged uh, 3.5 million euros and the Inter-American uh, Development Bank 2 million USD to support this facility. The facility aims to support member cities of C40 in developing countries and emerging uh, economies to prepare finance-ready projects for investment and to build capacity and to further catalyze action through uh, sharing knowledges and, 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 and to, to, to scale up uh, experiences. The German contribution to the facility is implemented by GIZ, by the CFF, so this new project which has been now commissioned just at the end of the year, last year, and which we are now about to set up. Um, we have talked about the challenges, and uh, I think Katrin already uh, made this very clear. I just want to highlight one more aspect, and that's that uh, there is an in, in, enormous um, investment pressure on cities. Uh, so there's a figure of 60% of the projected urban area in 2030 is yet to be built. So that means on the one hand side, we need to build a lot. On the other hand side, it's a big question on how to build. Huh? So we have the risk of a lock-in development, meaning that what we build today will last for the next uh, 50 years to come and will basically uh, describe our, our, our development path which will also, on the other hand, offer the opportunity uh, for a transformation towards a more green and a more sustainable urban development. Um, putting that into numbers, there's this famous uh, figure of the uh, McKinsey Global Institute, which said, like, okay, we will need 57 trillion uh, US dollar in infrastructure investment until 2000. Uh, 30, most of that to be spent in cities. That's a figure beyond imagination, and I think the, the message is we need a lot of money. Oh, and um, basically, on, on city level, what, what everybody agrees is that there is a bottleneck, uh, and that's also that uh, the CDIA addressing, a bottleneck of finance flows towards the, 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 the urgent need of, of investments on local level. On the other hand, we do believe that there are potential investors, banks, institutional investors, or specialized funds, etc., and there are more and more innovative financing instruments available for cities. Um, there, the facility aims to, 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 to leverage. So we have, at the moment, agreed on just general principles of operation, meaning that the facility will be demand-driven. So we act upon city's request, and uh, that needs to be very specific. Yeah? Um, we uh, work in the best interest of the supported cities, meaning that we're not uh, working in particular to serve the interest of a capital provider or a construction company. No, in the interest is, uh, I mean, in the target of our intervention is the interest of the cities and the citizen. Whatever we do needs to be uh, embedded in a, in, a, in a strategic vision of a city, in their, in their development planning, etc. And uh, it must be financially sound, and meaning particularly um, that we will support cities not to run into a debt trap, so to speak. Yeah? Because um, I think that's one of the, the, the big ongoing discussion when it comes to creditworthiness and cities 
access to, to, to market finance is whether cities are ready or whether we are pushing cities towards a debt trap they might later, uh, that might later kind of limit their actions, which we are sometimes facing even in German communities uh, you, uh, or municipalities, as you're very aware of. So I'm going to skip through this. Um, and this is one example. What do you, we mean by, 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 by bridging the gap between cities and, and, and finance? The thing is we are looking at, at various instruments. And we, 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 we are not limited to, to, to debt finance. We are not limited to, to development banks as, as our partners. But we rather want to look at the city project, which has been forwarded by the city to us, and then help to identify the, the most suitable, um, most suitable uh, financing instrument. Huh? Um, so here is an example. Let's say we have a city which has a technically strong project. Let me add that, that, that one, uh, I, have to, I forgot to mention that one criteria, of course, is that these projects um, must aim to curb uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That's, that's, that's one of the, the only kind of, um, it must curb greenhouse gas emissions or it must target building uh, climate resilience in cities. So this is kind of the only criteria we put on the quality of, of, of the project in the first step. So um, we assume that cities put forward an uh, already well-developed uh, infrastructure project, let's say a BRT system, a bus rapid uh, a transport system. Um, they, they, they show their commitment and they show the ability to actually deliver on the project, but they're lacking the financing skills and the capacity, maybe also the, the skill in, in talking to potential investors. Uh, so they're, they're lacking the, the ability commu to communicate uh, to communicate right and to, to deliver their message. On the other hand, we have, we have potential investors, let's say a, a large fund, and, and they have their, their experts on, on, on making deals with cities, and then they're able to, to provide uh, cash to cities, and they're, they're, they're willing. Um, but they're lacking uh, technically and financially sound projects, as well as even maybe an understanding of the risk environment uh, faced in the city and a proper assessment of that. So um, here we want to come in and bridge the gap. Uh, so it's, it's, it's working towards both ends, working with cities and, and providing demand-driven support, as well as um, trying to, 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 to work with, with, with international investors and have them better understand the situation in the cities and adjust their, 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 their instruments accordingly. Here we have a concrete example we are working with at the moment in the frame of the Addis Abeba conference, Financing for Development. A group has formed, they're called the Sustainable Development Investment Partnership, ESTED, um, and they, they are formed around a couple of, 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 of interesting actors from, from private banks like the Deutsche Bank, Citibank, Standard Chater, to development banks, to multilaterals, um, to, to uh, bilateral development organizations, all aiming to, to, to have more and better investment in, in local infrastructure. So we have them on the one hand side, and then we have the cities on the other, hand, uh, other side, and one of our tasks will to bring them closer together, to invest in green and, and, and climate relevant infrastructure. How are we planning to do this? Um, this is now getting very technical and it's, it's I think you're all uh, experts on, on, on technical assistance, so I don't have to go too much into that. I think that what is important is that the city is, 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 is our target group. Yeah? So they are in the center of our intention. Um, Essentially, we will have a, we, we call it delivery unit because we, we thought that secretariat sounds too much of an administrative monster we want to create. No, it's all targeted towards cities, um, which will be steered by um, a steering committee and advised by different boards. I think this is important because um, when talking to cities and, and working with cities, all the decisions we make um, must be very transparent and they must be objective and especially when you're in this uh, kind of um, area between investors and cities. So I do believe that having advisory committees and a neutral steering committee is very important in this regard. What we aim for is 
that we later have kind of a multi-donor funding so that we can scale up support to more cities and even beyond these um, big cities of, of C40. This is the explicit target of the facility to extend the support. But we do understand that the, in the beginning we will focus on the, the C40 cities amongst others uh, because we do believe that the whole aspects of making cities ready to, to better invest into to climate relevant infrastructure um, can be done initially or with, with, with the big cities to lead the way and to show that it's actually possible. So um, 2016 is going to be a pilot year. So we, we intended to support three cities, which are yet to be selected. But we do have agreed on, on uh, two, two subjects uh, to be addressed. One is like um, transport, and the other one is uh, climate change adaptation slash urban resilience. That's a little bit uh, given or um, made conditional by the BMZ. So we will uh, select from a group of cities and uh, we develop selection criteria. Later on, we will um, hope that this will turn into a competition yeah? so that we can have annual calls, given that we have the additional funding provided, so that cities can apply for support by the, by the uh, facility. For this first round in 2016, we aim that uh, we can announce at the German Habitat Forum in Berlin the cooperation with uh, three pilot cities. In parallel, we are seeking to, to, to establish this, the, the facility as an own institution, own organization, with an, with an own governance structure and uh, their own, so to speak, legislation. Huh? Yeah, that's it in a quick, quick, quick nutshell. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Martin, and uh, yeah, thank you a lot, uh, all presenters, for these uh, great insights coming from a broader perspective of the COP21 um, to the consideration of cities and also this um, excellent example of C40 cities finance facilities. Um, I want to open the stage right now for questions. So um, please feel free to raise questions to the to the speakers. Um, if there are more, you can also send it in the chat, or you can use the the nice features on the left side. So, um, yeah, th there's a question from Joy Bailey from CDIA Manila. Hi, um, at COP21 on the issue of finance flows, was there any indication that eventually multilateral development banks will give direct grants or loans to cities? I think at the moment it's only AFU is doing that. Um, I, I guess this is a question actually to, to, to all the speakers. Eva, perhaps Lisa? I could, I, yeah, what I could generally say, I can talk about the multilateral development banks, maybe Martin can add on that, but I would like to stress again that when we're looking at the Green Climate Fund at the GCF, there I had uh, been uh, hearing in one of the presentations directly at COP that they always want to stress again that it's generally also open for financing at local level. But, and this is one of the big points that always come up in the question of bringing finance to the local level, of course it is based on um, a deli uh, on the development on bank bankable projects at the local level and there is still a gap of capacity building of the abilities of the cities. But generally, for, for example, as a uh, the big climate fund, the GCF, that would be also foreseen to deliver finance to the local level, of course, through the national uh, entry points, but that is one, one of the sources which can be accessed given the right uh, projects and the right frameworks. Yeah, exactly. This is Martin. Um, and that's exactly where, where we are pointing at. So there's one uh, bottleneck identified, the, the ability of cities to, to prepare bankable projects. That's where we want to target. But um, as you said correctly, there's also the other one is a, is a legal limitation. Yeah? So in many countries, even uh, uh, subnational um, borrowing is, is, is not 
uh, allowed by, by constitution or is just in the development. Huh? So there's also something where we have to have to look at and see in how far is that possible or in how far do every country is different. Every country is different in that regard. Um, to coming to your question, I know that the KFW is experimenting by providing uh, direct loans to, to cities. Um, more and more uh, AFD as well. So more and more bilaterals and, and development banks are experimenting with this. But as I said, it's a very complicated field because it's, it's different from country to country. Okay, Th thank you a lot, Martin, for this explanation. Um, and now we have another question uh, that comes from Ellen. Ellen, you can turn on your, your microphone and raise the question. I think it appears that there is no audio. Um, I would hand over to the next, to Renard's question, and Ellen, please, um, please write your question in the chat below, and I will then uh, read it. So the next question comes from Renard at Tipelke. Um He wrote, uh, "Hi Martin, thanks for your uh, power, uh, for your um, yeah, excellent presentation." <laughs> Can you say what experts are in your core team and what expertise you are sourcing from the, from the outside and from where? Other partners or consultants? Yeah, hello Rina. Um, good question. Um, the experts at the core team are 30% of Martin at the moment. So um, that's of course not, not enough. And, but, but we are aiming, of course, to, 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 to extend. And the thing is what we're looking at is to have a strong financial expertise in the core team, mainly to be able to, 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 to provide, to act as an honest broker for cities. Yeah? Because as the technical, as these financing, finance expertise is the one lacking at cities, I do feel that we do have to have a strong expertise within our core team. Having said that, I'm fully aware that this is very difficult to get. Yeah? And um, so I think this is one of the big challenges for us, to, 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 to be able to get them into the core team. And I'm not yet sure if we're able to get them within GIZ or if we have to outsource that to consultants. Um, the, the direct project support later on, I assume, will be uh, by, by, by individual consultants. Thank you a lot, Martin. Um, I, I think that that was a, um, yeah, the, the answer I was looking for. Now, Ellen is asking uh, also to Martin if, um, you all, if you're also working on grant opportunities for cities, as most of the financing as announced until now seems to be loans, and not everything is feasible to cities as loans, uh, you also mentioned the debt trap. Yeah, Aaron, thank you. Also, very good question. Um, I, I absolutely agree with what you have said, huh? and not everything is, is to be financed through loans. I mean, there are other possibilities than loans. Huh? There, there, there might be we go in with a public-private partnership, or, uh, or we can go through. I mean, there are many financing instruments. However, um, this project is not aiming making cities ready for grants. Uh, this is being done elsewhere, and I think also sufficiently. So this is actually really targeting uh, making cities ready for market finance. Of course, not everything can be financed through that, but we want to be uh, specific and targeted to, to, to leverage this opportunity. Perhaps I may just add on what uh, Martin just correctly said, uh, talking about the the um, yeah the general 
a framework for cities to get grants, for example. This is also another um, very important point that had been raised in Paris and also um, before, which is the credibility of cities for getting uh, finance may it be from public side or from private side and uh, perhaps to mention um, Katrin has been talking about the Lima Paris Action Agenda about various initiatives that have been presented uh, during COP in, the, in this framework and one of them was the City Climate Finance Finance Leadership Alliance, which is an alliance of various banks, of UN organizations, of international corporations um, that are also working on these issues of what needs to be done to get further, especially private investments in cities, but also working on how the credibility of cities can be raised so that it is easier for cities to get also finance from banks, etc., on a on a loan basis, uh, so to overcome these problems and grant facilities also is still um, uh, one of the aspects which in, in international cooperation has still worked on in, in different facilities in different projects on a smaller scale. Thank you a lot Martin, thank you a lot Lisa. Uh, the next, next question comes from Leah Flasbola and uh, she says thanks for all your interesting inputs and her question is regarding private investment finance mobilization so how is the heterogeneity small and medium sized versus mega cities addressed how can small and medium sized cities be made attractive for private investments um, who, who wants to answer Martin Um, again, good question. Um, I think it's again a, a two-sided sword. Huh? So on the one hand side, um, generally we have to, 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 to think about how to, to, to make, as you correctly said, uh, I think it was Katrin, and, and to make cities credit worthy, but also with, with careful and, and with careful clothes on, on our hands, yeah? in order not to push them towards towards the, the, the debt trap. So this is the challenge. I do believe the, the big cities are the forerunners in this regard. Yeah? So um, because they are more advanced, they have already reference projects, they have uh, better institutional capacity, better human capacity, they are, they are a little, little bit further. So in order also to, to, to talk on national level uh, about creating the, the, the required um, legal framework conditions towards cities accessing market financing, we need some forerunners. Uh, we need some, some, some working examples. And this in our book must be the, 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 the big cities in the first hand. And, and then come the, the small and medium sized cities. Um, I know this is not a very <laughs> satisfying answer to your question. But um, from, from our perspective, this is our approach. Huh? Is that okay? Okay, there comes the next question. Um, yeah, it's about from Kama. Um, about priority areas for cities, um, could you could you please clarify your questions? What what do you mean? Come now. Ah, oh, okay. Um, there. Any sectors identified for providing finance to cities like high potential of um, greenhouse gas emissions and co-benefits? Could you kindly specify to whom it relates? To Martin. <laughs> uh, that's a general question. I think the others could do. Who, I, mean, I mean, you can also talk about what happened in the in the COP huh? and, to, and, and and what sectors were more um, 
what your feelings were, which sectors were most prominently discussed, because that would be in interesting for me as well. What we are talking about is mostly on, on, on transport, huh? but it's not that this is the, 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 the one with the highest potential for greenhouse gas emissions or that it's the most effective, but it's, it's basically a political decision also by the German government. So um, I would forward this question to, to, to Katrin and, and Lisa. What is your expression, impression from the COP? Were, were there special sectors uh, that were, be, were discussed more intensively? What was your impression? Yeah, I think generally when talking about uh, climate change at the local level, of course, it uh, encompasses all sectors because there's always a very strong um, argument for looking at integrated urban development, of course. So in urban development, that does not specifically look at one sector, but that looks at the connections between different sectors, the integration of different departments within the cities to have an overall look because it is uh, an, a topic that has to be addressed by the various sectors, be it energy, building, transport, waste, uh, even consumption. So this is quite clear that it needs to be an integrated look and there is not one special sector. But when we look from just my personal impression uh, on what sectors stick out a little bit, probably due to their mitigation potential and also looking at what has been most prominent in the Lima Pro section again there when we look at the initiatives that has been raised within uh, certain topics within certain sectors but also in the connection to the city development then it is as you said Martin it's the transport sector and on the other side it's the energy sector, so energy consumption um, as one part of resource efficiency, increase um, energy efficiency and also the use of renewable energies is a very important task in the overall debate and climate change mitigation, so this is also from great importance in the cities, I think especially with regard to buildings and as we know there are so many buildings and housing still to, uh, yeah, to be built in the urbanization to come, so and also from a, from a personal point of view, what I noticed and from what I hear with the department I'm working with in the uh, Environment Ministry, the energy and housing part is a very big part, which uh, where I've seen a lot of potential also within Germany, for example. But it's not limited to these sectors. I think that's also, especially when coming to adaptation to resilience, then it's also looking, as I already said at the beginning, at an integrated picture and to see what is possible, what is can best be done as well as at the city level. Thank you, Lisa. So um, a, another question comes from Vaishali. Um, it's addressed to, to Lisa. What is the current discussion in uh, BMUB post Paris regarding green sinks, links to urban planning and integration of both mitigation and adaptation in the same approach for cities? Okay, first of all, I think it has to be said that the um, the positions that the um, yeah th that different countries and also the different ministries are taking post Paris that is still something in progress. So at all levels, at all in all organisations, there is still this momentum taking place. Okay, now we have the Paris outcomes. What does this really mean for our work? How do we p position ourselves? What will we take on? What does it mean for us? So I think this discussion is just starting somehow. Um, green things and urban planning, I, I, if I understand correctly, you're looking at like green spaces within uh, cities and uh, municipalities. Um, of course, the, the uh, BMUB, as it's the ministry in charge of um, uh, on the one hand side building and urban development and on environmental issues, there's a big uh, focus also on the national level. And if I just look on the national level and the BMUB, what they are looking at, the, the aspect of talking about compact cities as a very important uh, urban form which uh, enhances um, efficient use of resources, especially energy, um, then is the one part of mitigation, but it is always stressed that it needs to be a compact and green city. Um, so that there is this balance between compact structures to facilitate the resource efficiency on, on the other hand, but to balance it with green spaces exactly to, to also 
not all go for high res or something like that, but to look at um, how can I bring also the, the greener parts in the city and you as you're asking for biodiversity, this is one point. So uh, looking, integrating these areas of mitigation and on the other hand also uh, adaptation, resilience and uh, um, to protect biodiversity in areas, green cities, as far as I can see in the national development policies in Germany that are also uh, communicated in the international processes, it's an important part of uh, yeah, integrating green areas, integrating uh, biodiversity within cities. There's, for example, one project of the BMUB with Mexico um, where green spaces, biodiversity protection uh, as part of climate change in cities is one of the priority areas. I hope that gives a little bit the answer that you were looking for. So, and um, a last question comes from Alexandra Linden here from CDIA. Uh, yes, hello everyone. I would have a very practical question towards Martin because you presented to us uh, the actual mechanism you were thinking of uh, to reach the cities and help them link their, their projects to finance. So how long do you think would actually the engagement with each of those cities last? So because you were mentioning an annual call so are we talking of in-city expert and the pool of backup experts within the course of a year or is it for longer term engagement that you are aiming at with each of the cities? Yeah, hi Alex. Um, uh, to be very honest, I don't know. Um, so um, we currently work with an expert who has been uh, who has been helping the the city of uh, Dakar in Senegal to set up municipal uh, municipal bonds for 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 an, for for an investment project in Dakar. That took two years, huh? and it failed. Um, so this is of course an extreme example, but um, uh, I think it's it really depends. I, I could imagine cities being already well prepared, and they need a little push, which would take about three to to five months and others which, which, which take longer. It's um, really difficult to assess and that's why we are, we are, we are now getting in, in touch with the, with the cities. Um, we're getting a team on board to help us understand better what is actually needed in the cities. Um, but of course we target um, for a success within the first two years of the project. Yeah? So um, that should be the ultimate goal. Thank you a lot. Um, we're reaching almost one hour. So um, I also have a last question. Um, well, it can be addressed to all of the speakers, actually, because Turbo Click is um, a working group based, mainly based um, yeah, in, in Asia with Asian uh, programs here. So um, what do you think will be like a certain uh, challenge or also uh, like what have, has to be considered actually in the Asian region um, in particular. So um, yeah, I, I would also, I, I would give it to, to the three of you actually, uh, what, what do you think? And um, yeah, maybe Katrin as well because you've been at the Asian Pacific Urban Forum. Where do you see the challenges here? Oh, uh, she writes, she, she has a problem with the microphone. Um, yeah, Martin, Lisa, you also have experience in Asia. Do, do you want to respond? Oh, yo, challenges in, in, in Asia. Um, uh, uh, the thing is, I think uh, you...